Hi, my name is Omar Cummins, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first reader and community leader, Sandra Mackey. Sandra is the Chief Marketing Officer of Bon Secours Mercy Health. Sandra's role focuses on helping people like you and me learn more about Mercy Health Hospital and connecting with the communities around them. Sandra is also active in the community, serving as Chair of FC Cincinnati Foundation Board of Directors. And here is Sandra Mackey reading The Oldest Student by Rita L. Hubbard. Hello, my name is Sandra Mackey, and I'm here to read along with you today a book that is fast becoming one of my favorites. One of the things that I love to do is read. From the time that I was a little girl, that is one of my all-time favorite things to do. When I was young, I'd nestle away every time I had the opportunity and tuck into a corner with my favorite book and read and read until my mother used to tell me time for chores. Today, I'd like to share this book with you and it's called The Oldest Student, How Mary Walker Learned to Read. This book was written by Lorraine Hubbard and co-author and illustrator, Ogie Mora, who was the Caldecott Honor winner, illustrated this book as well. So let's get started. I'll start with the preface. And the preface is a summary of what you're going to hear about in the book. In 1948, Mary Walker was born into slavery. At the age of 15, she was freed. At 20, she was married and had her first child. At 68, she was still working and raising money for her church. At 114, she was the last remaining member of her family. At 116, Mary Walker learned to read. Caldecott honor-winning illustrator Ogie Mora partners with rising star author Rita Lorraine Hubbard to tell the remarkable true story of the nation's oldest student who with perseverance and dedication proved that you're never too old to learn. Here are some pictures of Mary Walker over the years, you see her celebrating her 99th birthday. You see her as she grew older and older at the age of 20, 121. And so we're about to sit back and tuck into this book, The Oldest Student. Whenever young Mary Walker was tired, she would shield her eyes from the sun and watch the shallow-tailed kites dip and soar above the trees. That must be what it's like to be free, she thought. There's a picture of her, an illustration. But Mary didn't watch for long. Even at only eight years old, she knew the first rule of Union Springs, Alabama, plantation that she lived on, keep on working. She knew the second rule too. Slaves should not be taught to read or write or do anything that might help them to learn to do so. Mary didn't stop working. She didn't learn to read either. But at the end of each long day, picking cotton, toting water to Papa and the other slaves who cropped wood for the train tracks or helping her mom clean the big house, she would lie in her little bed next to the crumbling fireplace and think about those birds. When I'm free, I'll go wherever I want and rest whenever I want. And I'll learn to read too. When she was 15, it happened. Mary and her mother, brothers and sister were free the Emancipation Proclamation said so. What it didn't say was how a family with nothing except tattered garments on their backs could find food, clothes, and a place to sleep. Mary's father had died and the family was on its own. 
Freedom Road, Freedom Road. Across fields and through woods, ex-slaves surged like waves crashing hard to shore. Now that they were free, every road was Freedom Road. Many headed north and west and every which way, searching for long lost family members or simply experiencing the wonders of being free. And here's the illustrations. Freedom Road. Others, like Mary, chose to stay in the South. An organization called the Freedom's Bureau, Freedman's Bureau, helped those who stayed on stayed to find shelter and abandoned Confederate land. Mary and her family settled in a one-room cabin, and for the next few years, she worked alongside her mama to help feed her siblings. Seven days a week, she churned butter, cleaned houses, and cared for other folks' children. The hours were long, and if Mary was thirsty or hungry, or needed to use the outhouse, she had to wait until, until she got home. At week's end, she would offer Mama the only lonely quarter that she had earned. Here she is hard at work. One day, Mary met, met a group of evangelists on the roadside. A woman with soft wrinkles in her kindly face placed a big, beautiful Bible in Mary's hands and told her, your civil rights are in these pages. Mary didn't know what civil rights were. She only knew that top to bottom, front to back, that book was filled with words. I'm going to learn to read those words, she vowed, but not today. Today, there's work to be done. And tomorrow too. When Mary got married, she told her husband, she and her husband worked as sharecroppers, renting someone else's house, using someone else's tools, and planting someone else's seeds to farm land they would never own. After they harvest the crops, almost all of the money they earned went to pay for housing, tools, and the seed costs. Mary was 20 years old when her first son was born. She opened the Bible and marveled at the squiggles inside. There had been no time to learn to read. A friend wrote Mary's son's birthday in the Bible, August 26th, 1869. Then Mary dipped a pen into an inkwell and made her mark beside it. Not a letter, not a name, just a mark. It was the best she could do. See, there she is with her son. One day, Mary's husband died. She married again, and a second son was born, then a third. Mary made marks for these sons too. Now she had three grown boys. More money, that's what we need, Mary thought. But the only jobs available to black women were as maids or nannies or cooks. The hours were long, with only half a day off on Saturdays. And like sharecropping, they didn't pay much. Mary sighed. Words would have to wait. For the next four decades, Mary sharecropped and did odd jobs to help support her family. In 1917, Mary's family moved to a little city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was the year of Chattanooga's great flood. The story was in all the newspapers, but Mary could only study the pictures to understand what happened. By now, Mary was 68 and too old to sharecrop, but she continued to work. 
cooking, cleaning, and babysitting. She also fried fish, baked cakes, and sold sandwiches to raise money for her church. On Sundays, she would sit in the congregation, and as the preacher spoke, she would clutch her family Bible, the Bible she still could not read. When Mary was well past 90, she and her husband sat in their creaky rockers while one of their, one or another of their sons read to them. After the two younger boys died, the eldest read. Then Mary's husband died. Several years later, her eldest son died too. He was 94. Mary had outlived her entire family. She was 114 years old and alone. Can't read, she said. Can't write. I don't know anything. Mary stood at the window of her retirement home and gazed down at the world below. Words were everywhere, on billboards, on buildings, on store windows, on trucks. She sighed all this time, she thought, and they still look like squiggles. Mary had heard about a new reading class in her building. She pursed her lips. No more waiting, she decided. Time to learn. Out of her apartment, into the elevator and down to the lobby she went. When the elevator door sprang open, Mary saw people sitting under a sign with a picture of an open book. She could not read the words. A neighbor walked up to her. That's the reading class, Miss Mary. Can I help you over? Mary shook her head. Then she gripped her cane, lifted her chin, and walk straight towards the sign. For the next year or more, Mary put everything she had into learning to read. It wasn't easy. After all, she was the oldest student in the class and probably in the entire country. Could someone of her age learn to read? She didn't know, but by God, she was going to try. She studied the alphabet until her eyes watered. She memorized the sounds each letter made and practiced writing her name so many times that her fingers cramped. She learned to recognize sight words and then challenged herself to make short sentences with them. She studied and studied until books and pages and letters and worlds swirled in her head while she slept. One fine day, Mary's hard work paid off. She could read. Word of her accomplishments traveled and people everywhere celebrated with her. Chattanooga's mayor, newspaper journalists across the country, and a man from the US Department of Education who said, Mrs. Mary Walker, I pronounce you the nation's oldest student, all shared her joy. There they are celebrating. And there are the words that she could see. Buy, bakery, shop, Towers store. Wow. Mary felt complete. She still missed her sons, but whenever she was lonely, she read from her Bible or looked out of her window and read the words on the street below. From then on, Chattanooga's, Chattanoogans honored Mary's achievements with yearly birthday parties. 
In 1966, President Lyndon B. Johnson sent well wishes on Mary's 118th birthday. And in 1969, President Richard Nixon did the same. Mary was now 121 years old. Mary received many gifts over the years. A radio, a sofa, her very first television, a new Bible, the keys to the city, and perfume and champagne from the Canadian Mounties. She also received something that brought back those long days in the Alabama cotton fields, her very first airplane ride. From the cockpit window, Mary gazed at the trees and the rooftops below. No different than a horse and buggy ride, she joked, but she knew it was as the airplane dipped and soared like those shallow tailed kites of long ago. Mary decided that flying was a lot like reading. They both made a body feel as free as a bird. Each year before her birthday celebration came to an end, someone would whisper, let's listen to Miss Mary. The shuffling and movement would fade away until not a sound was heard. Then Mary would stand on her old, old legs, clear her old, old throat, and read from her Bible or her school book in a voice that was clear and strong. When she finished, she would gently close the book and say, you're never too old to learn. Thank you for joining me in listening to this book today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.